Great. Uh, thanks, Denise. Um, so I feel a little like we're going back in time, although also back to candy. Um, and this is uh, a presentation about what I would consider a preliminary TAR project that I started in the um, scientific teaching course at Yale. And um, I really developed it along with my other group members, especially um, Esther. So Esther and I are both postdocs in the medical school. And um, I'm a microbiologist, and she's an immunologist. Next slide, please. And we wanted to think about, um, as we developed a project as part of our course, how we could teach students about microbiology using a hands-on activity that wasn't in the actual lab. So not not a not a uh, experiment that you're looking at um, antibodies or bacteria. Um, and ex specifically, we wanted to try to teach students about the microbiome. So for this um, project, we developed a lesson uh, using kind of an iterative design process where we just trial the lesson multiple times, both in the scientific teaching class and then twice in uh, undergraduate non-majors biology and immunology classes. Next slide. So we wanted students to understand what the microbiome was. The microbiome is the group of bacteria and other microbes that are um, on or in the body of another organism. And in humans, when we talk about the microbiome, we usually mean the bacteria in your um, intestinal system. So we wanted them to be aware of the diversity of bacteria in the microbiome, the basic functions that it um, performs, and the concept of dysbiosis, which is an imbalanced microbiome. And then we also wanted them to kind of go to the next level in Bloom's taxonomy and predict the activities of antibiotics on that community and suggest um, how different treatments or interventions might modify the microbiome. Next slide. Um, so we needed the project to be about 20 and 30 minutes and have a quick pre and post assessment. We wanted something that would be enjoyable for the students and um, involve collaborative, inclusive, and active learning and be flexible enough that it could be modified for different student audiences. And we also wanted to integrate in our activity some data interpretation, analysis, and display, which is important for all science courses. Next slide. So this is just a snapshot of the activity we designed. So what we did was model the microbiome using multicolored candies. If you're in America, they're called runts, right? Um, so the students each receive a semi-random assortment of the candies. Each type of candy represents a different member of the microbiome. So the students then counted these, compared their biomes, and then simulated an antibiotic treatment that um, changed the distribution of the candies or of the microbiome. And then the students um, analyzed how that uh, change their microbiomes and discuss the consequences. And then we also interspersed in this um, lecture items which described um, an excellent example of dysbiosis, which is um, Clostridium difficile associated diarrhea. So then we had some pre-assessment and post-assessment questions for the students, and we asked them um, within the class and the discussion to describe and predict um, some different effects of the microbiome. Next slide, please. So we've run this trial um, uh, uh, four times, uh, and five times if you include our design process. So the initial design was just within our small group of four individuals. We did our initial testing and some modeling, some practice, and created the pre and post assessment. Um, then we did a peer trial in our course. Um, and after that trial, we streamlined the instructions and clarified some of our objectives, and then tried to decrease the lecture time. Um, we did a first trial. I think actually the professor we trialed with, Paula Kalathis, is in the room virtually with us. Um, and after that, we needed to clarify the lecture, and we had some student misconceptions we needed to correct and change the way that we did the lecturing. And uh, we also reduced our pre reading. Um, and then we had a second student trial this semester um, where we also needed to clarify some definitions, but we got really great results from our post assessment indicating that the students understood the concept and enjoyed the activity. Um, next slide. So uh, the students overall had um, vastly positive reactions to the lesson. They thought that the candy helped to show the microbial diversity. When we tuned our lecture um, to go along with what they needed to understand, they really seemed to get the concept. Um, they thought it was engaging and fun. And the only negative reactions we got from students was that we maybe could have been a little clear in our definitions. Some students thought it was a little bit overwhelming how we charted the data. And then about one out of 20 students in each class thought that the activity was too simple and we should have just lectured about it. Next slide, please. So 
this is really a development of the lesson, uh, which we're working on publishing right now. Um, and we'd like to repeat using this lesson and change to using a more quantitative assessment of student knowledge, um, either a quantitative pre and post assessment and um, also possibly looking at students' learning gains on a final exam. And if we had those assessments set up, we'd like to um, compare those gains with activity versus just a lecture comparison and test this maybe in a variety of audiences, either larger courses, smaller courses, or students with different backgrounds. Um, our takeaway from this project is that a carefully designed project can teach microscopic concepts, but any lesson really has to be reveal, repeated and evaluated by students and other observers to prevent misconceptions. We were surprised at how many misconceptions the students could come up with in a relatively short uh, activity. Next slide, please. So I'd like to acknowledge um, Paula. I'm sorry I forgot to put you on this slide. Uh, our design team, Esther, myself, Barack, and Kamichi, um, our teachers and uh, other students from the CERTL course in scientific teaching. And thanks to CERTL, um, Corey, Denise, and Miranda for helping me and allowing me to do this presentation. That's it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Thank you. So we have plenty of time for questions for Shauna. Um, I do have a question right off. Um, are you, have you heard of the process of design-based research? It sounds like that's really what you did. You did the several iterations and kind of quick testing and revising with what you learned from every time. It sounds like very much like what you did. I think that, that term comes out of software um, testing, but it seems very similar. Yeah, I think it is similar. Um, I hadn't heard of design-based research, but I think I, I read about it in the CERTL Journal Club that I'm taking right now. That's awesome. Um, so yeah, what were some of the student misconceptions? Um, after the first trial, I think I got a little excited when I was lecturing about um, treating C. diff at, with antibiotics and how um, getting antibiotics in the hospital can cause people to have this sort of secondary disease. And so a lot of the students came away thinking that antibiotics were bad and you shouldn't take them, um, which was definitely a misconception that we needed to correct. So uh, we had to be a little bit more careful about how we were talking about um, dysbiosis and this idea that diseases can happen depending on um, the sort of homeostatic state of your body, which is actually a really important biological concept. And so uh, we just had to be a little bit more careful about that. Great. And uh, how did the IRB process affect your ability to change and refine your experiments? That's a good question. Um, since this wasn't an official um, research project where we had um, different groups, we just trialed it in a, in a class. So we didn't have to do an IRB. That's interesting because it's also true for a lot of institutions have very different um, requirements for their IRB, so that might not be true at other institutions, but that's great yeah. for yeah, IRB <laughs> exemption for the one. Excellent. As far as so, I know, we didn't need to complete an IRB. Um, I think that if we did some quantitative assessments um, and had groups that needed to or didn't need to have uh, this activity, then we would definitely need to do an IRB, I guess. Yeah. Great. So Miranda actually has a question. Go ahead, Miranda. Yeah, I have a quick question related to the first question, actually. I was just curious, did you change your pre- and post-assessments after each of the trials, or did those kind of remain the same? We did not change the pre- and post-assessments. They were just pretty simple questions on the worksheet that the students used to do the activity, um, but we did change the lecture. Yeah. Um, I also wondered how much do students know about the microbiome beforehand? It's something that I've learned a lot about in the last few years, but it still seems relatively recent. So is it something that some people come in not knowing anything about? Yeah, uh, they don't know a lot about it. I think some students had a vague idea from their responses um, that there was a microbiome. I'm just looking at the exactly what our pre-assessment question was. Um, we asked them to name a body compartment with a natural microbiome and a function performed by the microbiota, um, and also talk about what part of the human body would be sterile as, as ways to test their pre-activity um, knowledge. And some of them had an okay idea, but um, a lot of, about half the students, I would say, probably named incorrectly sterile compartments and um, didn't, they really didn't seem to understand the functions of the microbiome before. Um, they understood that they existed, but not like what functions they might perform 